Well, hello, Shelter Rock Church, uh, and welcome to Church Online. Uh, my name is Henry, and I'm one of our teaching pastors on staff. And I'm so glad that you joined us today as we begin a new teaching series entitled Love, Walk, Do. Three simple words, um, three simple verbs, actually, um, that capture and encapsulate not just the heart of God or the character of God, but really what is the will of God for your life and for mine. If you've ever wondered what kind of people God longs for us to be or what God requires of us as people who follow him, well, they can be captured in those three words, love, walk, and do. Now we're gonna unpack what that means over the next three to four weeks together. But really those words are taken right out of the book of Micah chapter six, verse eight. And we're gonna use those verbs as a framework for our teaching series through the month of September. Uh, I want to drop into Micah chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 together today just to provide a little bit of context. But I want to let you know that uh, Micah was writing in a time and a place very similar to where you and I find ourselves today. It was a time filled with uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. There was political instability and turmoil all around them. He's writing it about the, the 8th century BC at a time when the Assyrian king had just taken throne and, and was beginning to build his empire all around uh, Jerusalem and Israel. In fact, in 722 BC, the uh, Assyrian king would come in and capture Israel and would remain a threat to the people of Judah in the south for years to come. There was this sort of outside threat of violence that was imminent and they lived in fear. But there was also all sorts of discord and division happening within the Israelite community. You see, there were wealthy landowners living in Judah that were getting prosperous over the oppression of the poor. They were mistreating God's people and they were really being driven by self-interest. And so Micah writes to them, to these people who are living really far away from God in the midst of their fear. And he calls them back. He calls them to repentance and he gives them this real summary of what it means to follow after God in their world. And I think what Micah says to Israel then, back what, 2,800 years ago now, has enduring relevance and significance for you and for me today. So we're gonna drop into the text, Micah chapter six, we're gonna read verses one through eight and we're gonna focus on verse eight together. Read along with me. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. Micah is really taking the posture here of a, of a litigator. Any lawyers watching, you can appreciate the, what he's doing here. He's making a case, a legal case against the people of God. And he invokes creation, the, the mountains, the foundations of the earth, as his witnesses to be a jury listening to this argument. And this is about to be an indictment against the people of God about the ways they have wandered away. Look at what he says. Verse three, uh, this is God speaking through Micah. He says, my people, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? Answer me. I have brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent you Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of, son of Boar, answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. He's, he's rehearsing salvation history. He's going back in time and bringing them back with him. And he's saying, do you remember the Exodus when you were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but then I raised up leadership to set you free? Do you remember when I brought you to the promised land? I love this verse right here, which says, do you remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal? Shittim is on the east side of the Jordan and Gilgal is on the west side. Uh, the, the area of Shittim was the area where they last camped before they crossed over the Jordan into the promised land. And Gilgal was the place they first camped on the other side. He's saying, do you, do you remember how I, how I parted the Jordan and brought you through from one side 
to the other. Can you remember all the great things I have done? Do you remember my mercy, my intervention, my love displayed in your life? Do you remember the acts of the Lord? Verse 6, uh, with what shall I come before the Lord, you may wonder, and bow down before the exalted God? He's asking a rhetorical question. Notice what he says. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Uh, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's, he's asking this rhetorical question, like, what does God require of us? Does he require burnt offerings, sacrifices, a sacrificial lamb? And notice how each verse escalates a little more. Will God be pleased with thousands of rams or how about 10,000 rivers of olive oil? What about our children? What if I sacrificed my firstborn for my sin? Is this what God requires of us? And then Micah answers the question. Look at verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Here it is. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's one of the great summaries of all the law and really God's heart and God's requirement on his people. God's will for you and me. You say, what is God's will for my life? I can tell you right here. What does the Lord want for us? That we would do justice. We would love mercy. That we would walk humbly with our God. In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of fear, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of outside threat and persecution and all sorts of things going on outside of us, in the midst of internal strife and division and discord that was happening in Israel, Micah has these words. What God requires of us is that we be a people in the midst of a broken world who do justice, who love mercy, and who walk humbly with our God. Today, we're going to look at uh, loving mercy. We're going to look at them a little bit out of order. We're going to talk about what does it mean to love, walk, and do. And today we're going to look about what does it mean to love mercy. But to understand how to love mercy, uh, we first need to understand what mercy is. And so to, to describe mercy, I want to, I want to tell you a, a story. It's a true story. Uh, it goes back to 1996 of a young girl by the name of Keisha Thomas. Uh, the story takes place in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on that day, uh, in 1996, um, a, a rally from members of the KKK was scheduled to take place in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, it was a small rally of white nationalists who wanted to, to march in Ann Arbor, which was kind of a progressive city, still sort of is. It's a college town. But they wanted to march there, and they wanted to, to march for white pride. And people who lived in Ann Arbor were unhappy that this group of KKK members were going to come into their town. And so uh, there started a, a counter protest. And, and a bunch of people, about 200 of them from the community, rose out to sort of march alongside and against uh, these white nationalists. And so I want you to picture the scene for that day. This is 25 years ago, but this happened. Uh, you've got a, a whole group of KKK members in, in robes and hoods and everything else and, and on the one side. And on the other side, you've got a group of people from the community who don't want them there. And these are, are two people on the two groups of people that are on opposite sides of each other. And in the middle are law enforcement and police officers trying to make sure that there is peace and keeping everybody safe as they march together through the city streets. Well, the march went on for a while with both sides sort of just hollering and yelling back and forth at one another. But all of a sudden, there was a man who was with the white nationalist group who got separated from the crowd. Uh, he wasn't in a hood or a robe, but he was wearing a Confederate flag t-shirt and he had a tattoo that said SS on it. So he, he was a man who was marching with the white nationalist who got separated from the crowd. And it was someone from the local community who shouted out, look, there's a Klansman. And they started taunting this man and chasing after him and separating, from him, uh, for, so separating him from everybody else. And they began to, to chase after him and the man started to slowly run away. There was a photographer there who captured the moment and, and you see these images of, of this man running away from the crowd. But the crowd began to pursue and as they pursued, they became more violent. They ended up 
attacking this man, throwing him to the ground and taking some of the, the, the sticks from the placards that they were holding and, and hurting him with it and beating him down on the ground. And so here's the scene, right? You've got the community uh, coming on top and attacking this man who was a white nationalist in, in a largely predominantly black community. And he's down on the ground and they're beating him. And all of a sudden, this young 18-year-old girl named Keisha Thomas jumps on top of the man. But she doesn't jump on top of him to attack him. She jumps on top of him to protect him. And she begins fighting off everybody else. And in the ensuing struggle, she begins to, to start taking some of the blows herself. And she begins to take the shots that were intended for him. And she, she wraps her arms around him and she covers him and she starts taking all of the blows for him. The photographer who took these photos said later that he, he decided to keep these photos on his desk and he keeps them on his desk to this day because he, he said he had never seen anything like that before. She said, here was a man who was out there filled with hate in his heart towards people like her. And yet there she was, ready to sacrifice herself, put herself at risk and even endure some harm to provide protection and care and love and concern for someone who probably wouldn't do the same for her. He, he remarked, I don't know who in this world would ever do anything like that. Now, if you and I are honest, we could admit most of us would agree. There are not many of us in this world that would act that way. Not many of us in this world that would respond the way Keisha did on that day. But as Christians, we know that Jesus is building a different kind of world. That he's building a kind of world where acts of love and kindness and mercy for those whom would otherwise be against us or those whom we should not show mercy towards would become the norm for the people of God. Jesus said to himself, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. See, mercy is when we give someone what they do not deserve and we show compassion, protection, provision or care for someone who does not deserve it. In the Bible, there are two words used for mercy in the Hebrew Bible. Two words. Uh, one is the word that we find in our text today. Math, uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, uh, when he says to love mercy. It's the Hebrew word hesed. The Hebrew word hesed is one of the most rich words in the entire Bible. It appears over 245 times throughout the scriptures. And, and is really a word that's hard to translate. But translators usually translate it as, as loving kindness. It reflects to, to love that is shown really out of covenant loyalty or obligation. It's the kind of love, quite frankly, that's often described of God's love for us. So even though God's people were faithless, God remained faithful and he showed mercy because of his has said, because of his mercy and his loving kindness towards them. Uh, but there's a second word in Hebrew which may round out our understanding of the word for mercy. And it's the word racham, racham. Uh, this is a word that, that really means to, to care and protect someone else, to offer care and protection for another. Uh, the word raham in Hebrew is actually connected to the word for womb. Uh, if any moms are watching and you, know, you, you, you maybe uh, had a child that was in your womb, you know that a, a baby in a mother's womb is in a very vulnerable state. In fact, there's very few things more vulnerable than a child inside a mother's womb. And yet God created a womb as a place to provide protection, nurture, and care. And this is the idea of mercy in the Bible. Uh, mercy is when we provide protection and care and concern for those who are most vulnerable and most at risk. How does God want us to respond to the brokenness of our world? How, what does God require of his people? that we would be a community that loves mercy. I wanna unpack three truths for you and me today, three truths that we can hold on to, three reasons why we are called to show mercy and to love mercy and to embody mercy in our world. Okay, number one, mercy reflects the character of God. Mercy reflects the character of God. When we show mercy, we show the world the character of God. 
Uh, secondly, mercy enters into the suffering of others. Mercy enters into and meets the needs of others when they're in suffering or in pain. Mercy enters into the suffering of others. And number three, uh, mercy displays the gospel to the world. Mercy displays what is the heart of the gospel, that you and I are recipients of God's mercy. And therefore, when we give mercy to others, we give them a glimpse of a God who offers mercy to them. Uh, let's look at each in turn. Number one, mercy reflects the character of God. Uh, you can see the character of God revealed right here in our passage in Micah chapter 6. Uh, when, when Micah rehearses all that God has done, I brought you out of Egypt, he says in verse 4. I redeemed you from the land of slavery. Again, I sent you Moses to lead you, even Aaron and Miriam. See, God heard the cries of his people in Egypt and he didn't stay far off. No, no, he heard their cries and he came down to rescue them and he showed them Mercy. Do you remember your journey from each side of the Jordan? I was there and, and I did it so that you would know the righteous acts of the Lord. See, we have a God who is full of mercy. In fact, this is how God introduces himself to the Israelites in the book of Exodus chapter 34. In fact, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I'm going to turn there quickly and read it to you. Um, it's actually one of the most, in fact, I think it is the most quoted verse in the New Testament that references the Old Testament. It's Ex Exodus chapter 34. Uh, and we're going to read in uh, verse 6. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Um, if you know the text, right? Moses is on Mount Sinai. The Israelites had just built a golden calf after Moses came down to the Ten Commandments. They built up an idol and they were like, they had totally turned away from God, rebelled against God. And really what they deserved was the judgment of God. But Moses went back up on the mountain and asked God and pleaded with him to forgive and show mercy to these people. And then he asked to see his glory. And God came down and he walked in front of Moses. And as he walked, he spoke to him and he told him who he was. And this is what he says. He says, the Lord passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. See, God uh, had every right in that moment to pour down fire on his people who he had just rescued from slavery, but had built a golden calf and said, you were the one who rescued us from Egypt. He had every reason to pour out judgment. Instead, because he is full of mercy, because he is slow to anger, because he is abounding in love, he gives them a second chance. And if you know the Bible, you know he gives them a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. I and mean, This is what God does time and time again. Though his people are faithless, he remains faithful. See, we have a God who is full of mercy. And when we love mercy and when we display mercy and when we show mercy, when we forgive those who don't deserve to be forgiven, when we are kind to those in need, when we show favor and protection and care and do for others what they cannot do for themselves or what they do not deserve, we are reflecting the character of God. See, there are some people who have the gift of mercy. And when we read the New Testament, we see that mercy is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And there are some of you watching today who have the gift of mercy. And uh, I envy you, right? I know I shouldn't envy, but I envy you. Like, I, I don't have the gift of mercy. It doesn't come naturally to me. No, no, no. I, I, judgment, justice, self-righteousness, that comes naturally to me. I like mercy when it comes to me. But really, I really do. But, but, but I want everybody else to get what they deserve. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And if you do wrong, you deserve judgment. That's just sort of like how I'm wired, right? And so, so maybe, may, maybe you're like me and mercy doesn't come naturally to you. You're, you're strong on justice. You know, it's black and white. It's right or it's wrong. I want to I encourage you today. I want to challenge you today. You, you may not have the gift of mercy. But friends, you got the God of mercy. We have a God who is full of of mercy, who is abounding in mercy and in steadfast love. And Psalm 145 says that he offers his mercy to all. So you may not have the gift of mercy, but you and I, we have the God of mercy. So let us be a people who love to love 
mercy and love to show mercy to those who don't deserve it. When we have mercy, when we love mercy, we reflect the character of God. Uh, secondly, when we love mercy, uh, we are entering into the suffering of others, right? We are entering into the suffering of others. Notice God's mercy in Micah chapter 6 doesn't keep him far away. Mercy for God is not a feeling. Uh, it's an action. M -m mercy for God is not an attitude or a state of mind or a state of emotion. No, no. Mercy manifests its itself in concrete actions and behaviors. This is important, right? In Micah, he recounts all the different ways that God steps in and intervenes, that he, he enters into the plight of his people and he takes their problem and he makes it his problem. So that's what mercy does. Mercy enters into the plight of another, into the suffering of another, and meets them in their time of need. See, oftentimes we think of mercy as, uh, as really just uh, withholding punishment from what someone deserves. And that is a, a part of mercy, and the Bible talks about mercy in that way. But in the biblical imagination, uh, mercy is, is really more about active care and active protection for those who are most vulnerable. Uh, the word used here in Micah chapter 6, verse 8 is the word hesed, the word for mercy. And in the Bible, the word hesed is always a verb. It expresses itself in concrete ways. And usually hesed is used and mercy is used in the Bible to speak of uh, God's care of those who are most vulnerable, the poor, the orphan, the immigrant, and the widow, the, the quartet of the vulnerable, those who are most likely to be victims of injustice. God uh, has a heart and care and concern and intervenes on behalf of them, right? He's a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of the weak. This is our God. It's because he is full of mercy. But he calls his people to do the same, to enter into the suffering of others. Perhaps the best way we could illustrate this is uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the parable from Luke chapter 10. Jesus tells the story. It uh, begins with a question where an expert in the law asks him, what is it I must do to enter eternal life? And Jesus says, uh, well, love God and love your neighbor. And he says, well, I, I've done all of that. And well, or who is my neighbor? <laughs> and, then, and then Jesus tells the story of a, of a man who was lying in a ditch, a man who had been robbed, beaten, and left for dead. And a religious leader, a, a Levite, comes and sees the man in need and walks by the other side. And then a priest sees the man in need and then walks by the other side. You know the parable, right? The, the, the priest and the Levite, those who were supposed to be caring for the poor and then those who were in need, according to Levitical law, they got so preoccupied with their other religious duties that they started just, they saw the man and they went on their way. But then a Samaritan, someone who was from a different background, ethnically and racially and religiously and everything else, sees the man in need and intervenes. And he goes towards the man, which likely would have defiled him. But then he, he takes the man and he puts him on his own donkey and then he, he bandages his wounds. You know the passage. And then he, he brings him to an inn and he, and he puts him in, in the room and then he goes down to the innkeeper and he pulls out his wallet and he says, everything he has, put it on my tab. He picks up the tab. He picks up the bill, right? And then afterwards, Jesus says, who was it that was a neighbor to the man? He flips the question on the expert of the law. And do you remember what the expert in the law said? Luke chapter 10, he responds with these, these words. He says, the one who had showed mercy. See, even the expert in the law understood that mercy manifests itself in concrete ways. That, see, see, I don't want us to romanticize mercy, right? Mercy is inconvenient, right? You, you may have other things to do, other places to go, but mercy is often inconvenient. It often requires a cost. It often puts us in a place of very real risk, right? And it's gonna take a lot of us, but really what mercy is, is it's entering into the plight and suffering of another. And isn't this the good news of the gospel? that this is what God has done for you and for me in Jesus Christ. You and I, we were like the, the person in the ditch. We, we were left half dead. If it weren't for his mercies, you and I would be consumed, right? But the Bible says that while we were dead in our sins and trespasses, because of his great mercy for us, Christ died for us. Even while we were still sinners, he died for us. See, see it's not because of anything you and I have done that have brought us into this right relationship with God. Everything depends on his mercy. See, he's been merciful towards us. God saw us in our suffering and entered in. And he calls us as his people to do the same. We are called to love mercy. 
To, to love mercy is to reflect the character of God. Uh, to love mercy is to enter into the suffering of others. And to love mercy, lastly, is to display the gospel to the world. To display the gospel to the world. Right? When we show mercy, we show the world Jesus. And we give them a glimpse of the God who is full of mercy toward them. Uh, I want to read to you Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 5. It says this. Uh, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. For God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions. A dead person can do nothing for themselves, but God, because of his mercy, has made us alive. Or, or how about 1 Timothy, verse 1, 13. Paul says, for even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. When we extend mercy, uh, when we extend compassion or forgiveness for those within, with whom it is within our power to punish and harm, when we don't do that but would show them kindness and care and concern, we display the gospel to the world. I love what John Stott says, he says this, he says, the gospel is good news of mercy to the undeserving. The symbol of the religion of Jesus is the cross, not the scales. Think about that, the, the symbol of our faith is the cross, not the scales. He's talking about the, the scales of justice, that uh, some people think this is what God does. He sort of weighs our good deeds and our bad deeds. And he's sort of, you know, like Lady Justice holding them. And then depending on what we've done, good or bad, if it outweighs more than God will receive. He says, no, no, no. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can reach God's standard. None of us uh, could ever even the scales. The symbol of our faith is the cross where, where justice was satisfied. Jesus, who lived perfectly, satisfied the justice of God and took the punishment and judgment you and I deserve on himself and he did it so that he could extend mercy and so have you received mercy are you someone who knows the mercy of God have you received mercy for yourself have you received the good news of the gospel that Christ went on that cross to take the punishment that you deserve and if you've received mercy could you safely say you are a person who shows mercy as well I go back to this image of Keisha Thomas on, on this man. And I mean, tell me this isn't a picture of the gospel, right? That Jesus covered us uh, with, with his cross, right? And, and, and he takes the blows on the cross. He takes everything that we deserve and he does it. He endures it. He takes all of it so that you and I can come under his love, his protection and care. He takes all of the wrath so that you and I can receive mercy. See, I am convinced that the degree to which we show mercy is directly proportionate to our understanding of the mercy we have received. Do you know the mercy that Jesus has shown you? Let's bask in that today. Let us reflect on that today. Let, let, us, let us look at the cross and all that Christ has done. And from that place of knowing we have received mercy, let us be a people who go about our week, go about our parenting, go about our marriages, go about at work, go about in school, in our workplaces, wherever we are, eager to show people the kind of mercy that we have already received. We're going to close our service today by receiving communion. Pastor Mike's here with us and he's going to lead us in the Lord's table, a reminder for us of the mercy we have received. But before we do that, let's pray. Uh, Lord, our prayer is that we would be the kind of people that love mercy. And we don't just love it in our attitudes, but in our actions, and that we extend your mercy to the world. And in so doing, we would reflect your character as your people, that we would, that we would walk in your ways and according to your values. Lord, that we would enter into the suffering and the plight and the need and the pain of those around us, that we would be agents of healing wherever you would use us. And that God, in so doing, we would display the gospel of mercy and grace to the world. Use us, each and every one of us, today and this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen.